Okay, so these are the labs. Let me just go ahead and mute everyone really quick. These lab exercises we're doing today are on um, the nervous system and the special senses. I think this is exercises 10 and 11. And again, there's two Google activities to do. Um, since we've been over the nervous system and how it's kind of been subdivided, I'm gonna focus a little bit on the anatomical structures of it, that the part that you guys will be kind of working through the labeling in that virtual lab. Um, so here's a look at a neuron. Um, this was a model similar to what we would have in lab in black and white. And so this is kind of the whole big picture of the neuron here. You can see a zoomed in version of the cell body with a nucleus. And all of these are dendrites coming off. Um, the little kind of grayish pieces attached to each dendrite is the axon terminal of another neuron that's connected to this one. Um, you can kind of see some structures located inside the cell body itself. Um, but if we focus on this axon, that's again, this longer portion, the longer process extending out of the cell body. And then if we zoom in on the ax axon part, we can see the myelin sheath or the layers of myelin surrounding the axon, uh, the nucleus of the Schwann cell, which creates myelin in the peripheral nervous system. And the node of Ron Vier is any sort of um, indentation or separation or space between myelin sheaths. So that's a neuron. This is just a great table, all the structures and functions of the neuron itself. Here are the three different classifications of neurons. I think we went over this in lecture, possibly did in one of my classes. Um, the pseudipolar um, unipolar neuron has kind of this T-shaped structure with processes coming out in the cell body in the middle. Uh, the bipolar neuron has just one axon and one dendrite projection, kind of making a linear structure. And the multipolar neuron, um, meaning many processes coming out. So many dendrites coming off of the cell body and then one longer axon. The multipolar neuron is what most of our neurons um, are like. We have some bipolar neurons, uh, specifically in the eye. Here are various neuroglial cells. Um, I think this is probably what your test was on. You probably had a question on one of these. Um, so this is what an astrocyte looks like. It will have its little feet um, kind of surrounding the blood vessel to do that blood-brain barrier. Uh, the Schwann cells create myelin in the peripheral nervous system and the oligodendrocytes create myelin in your central nervous system. The ependymal cells will have cilia on the ends. They'll kind of uh, move the cerebral spinal fluid around in the ventricles. And then your microglial cells um, are the phagocytic cells. So they'll like engulf or get rid of any sort of um, harmful substances throughout the nervous system. Here are the lobes of the cerebrum, and they're all named for the skull bone that they'll sit underneath. So you can see here the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, and occipital lobe with the cerebellum as its own separate portion um, in the anterior or in the inferior posterior side of the brain. The brainstem comes off the bottom, and then you can see the sulcuses or sulci for plural, uh, dividing the lobes from each other. Here are the lobes again and the selected functions of each lobe. Um, within these lobes are a Broca area and a Wernicke area. Um, and you can kind of see just in general where the subdivisions are. Here's the precentral gyrus, which will be your motor cortex. The postcentral gyrus is your sensory cortex. And a gyrus is any brain fold of the cerebrum. Here's a look at the cerebrum from the superior view. Uh, the longitudinal fissure is a deep kind of more um, like a substantial kind of separation between brain gyri. So this will separate out your right hemisphere from the left hemisphere of the brain. Um, you can see where the lobes are labeled in relation, relation to the longitudinal fissure. Here's a look at the brain from an inferior view. So you can see the brain stem is made up of the midbrain, uh, the pons is this rounded portion, and then the medulla oblongata. Any sort of um, thing that's coming out of it, I call them little, they almost look like little tiny pieces of spaghetti. These are all of your cranial nerves coming out. 
you, we always label them with Roman numerals and they're labeled starting with the most anterior cranial nerve, which is the olfactory nerve. So that'd be cranial nerve number one. And then they're, they are a labeled um, working your way down. Um, so pay some special attention to the lab exercise, learning the locations of these cranial nerves as you guys are studying that. Here's a look at a uh, medial view of the brain and some of the structures within the brain. Um, you can see the cerebellum and how its white matter looks like branches of a tree. So we call that the arbor vitae. We also see um, some where the ventricles might be. The fourth ventricle is between the cerebellum and the pons, um, kind of the bullseye structure within the center of the brain. Um, this will be where your thalamus is located and the thalamus is, has two halves connected to each other with this interthalamic adhesion. Here's the pituitary gland. Um, the corpus callosum is this C-shaped structure and it connects the two hemispheres of the brain together. Um, the septum pellucidum is a thin membrane that also connects um, the corpus callosums together. Uh, what else here? The corpa quadremina um, is made up of the superior and inferior colliculus, these kind of two small bumps right there, excuse me. And the pineal gland uh, secretes melatonin, helps with your sleep-wake cycles, is this gland right there. I think that's it for this one. Again, it's showing all the lobes as well. Here's your spinal cord um, coming off of, from the medulla oblongata and the central canal within the spinal cord contains cerebral spinal fluid and the central canal will be continuous with all of your ventricles in the brain. Here's the brain stem. Um, the midbrain is directly connected to the cerebrum. It kind of holds up the brain, we call it. Here's your pons, and then the medulla oblongata is the part below the pons. Here's the model of the olfactory nerves. Um, it's cranial nerve number one. It's located in the nasal cavity because it'll have branches off of it these olfactory nerves that come through the cribriform plate in your ethmoid bone uh, to reach into your nasal cavity to help with olfaction or smelling. Here's another look at your um, cranial nerves, it, not counting cranial nerve number one, which is your ol olfactory nerve, but it gives you a better view about where these cranial nerves come off of um, the um, brain and spinal cord and specifically the midbrain, the pons and the medulla oblongata here. Uh, so this might be a better picture to study as you're looking at the cranial nerves. You'll notice the optic nerves will crisscross each other. So you'll see them right here. The ocular motor nerve goes to your eyes, trochlear nerve, trigeminal nerve, abducens nerve, hypoglossal nerve. Oh, some of these are kind of hard to keep track of. So again, just spend some time in that virtual lab uh, studying pictures like this. And like all lab exam, the pictures that you study in those exercises should be the ones that you're tested on. So hopefully that helps with the studying at least. The vagus nerve, cranial nerve number 10 is the only one that goes into the thoracic and abdominal cavities. So here's a look at um, the name of the cranial nerves and their selected functions. But again, for lab exams, you would just be, um, for the, I think all the time, you're just uh, supposed to know how to label them on pictures. All right, so here's the spinal cord itself and some anatomy of the spinal cord. Um, as you look here, the spinal cord is connected to the cerebrum. I know the picture is a little hard to see. Uh, the spinal cord has the same meningy layers that cover the brain. So you'll see um, the pia matter, the arachnoid matter, and the dura matter. That's kind of what uh, this is labeling, the three different layers around the spinal cord, um, the spinous process. The cauda equina is the spinal nerves that come off at the base of the spinal cord. So maybe the picture is better seen at this area. There are places in the spinal cord that are more enlarged, the cervical enlargement, the lumbar enlargement, the conus medullaris is the end of the spinal cord that occurs around L2, the L2 lumbar vertebrae. And then the cauda equina literally means horse's tail. You'll see that equestrian word in that having to do with horses. And if you ever get a chance to dissect a cadaver, um, dissecting out the spinal cord is actually pretty fun, I think, because you open up this, like the pia matter that surrounds it, 
and all this cotta equina just sticks out and it almost looks alien like it just looks like a bunch of spaghetti at the base of the spinal cord. I think it's cool. So think of me if you ever have to dissect a cadaver. Um, I think that's it. The phylum terminale connects um, the coccygeal nerves uh, to the coccyx. So kind of just to anchor the spinal cord down at the bottom. Um, so this is a kind of a zoomed in area of the end of the spinal cord. So it ends at the conus medullaris. So you can kind of see this dotted line. It's the end of the spinal cord is shaped kind of like a cone or a triangle. The cauda equina, um, the dura mater will surround it. It'll be in this pouch that you would have to, you know, cut open. And then the phylum terminale, again, kind of anchors the spinal cord down to, to your coccyx or your tailbone. Here's a cross section of the spinal cord itself. Uh, note that the lateral gray horn is only found in the thoracic and upper lumbar segments. It's important to note. Um, otherwise, uh, dorsal always means posterior and ventral means anterior. So this dorsal root ganglion contains all the cell bodies of sensory neur neurons and all sensory neurons will go, will enter the spinal cord via the dorsal root um, here is the dorsal gray horn, lateral gray horn, and ventral gray horn. It's hard to tell in a black and white picture, um, but the gray matter is this butterfly shaped or H shaped structure, and the white matter surrounds it. We divide the white matter into columns. Those are tracks, either ascending or descending of neurons, taking information to and from the brain. And the gray matter we divide into horns. The central canal runs through the length of the spinal cord. It contains cerebral spinal fluid. And then the ventral root will come out of the anterior side, the anterior horn. The ventral root contains all of your motor information. And a spinal nerve is just the joining or conjunction of all of the dorsal roots and ventral roots that come off of the spinal cord in each of its um, specific layers or segments. And this is a cool microscope view of the spinal cord. It would be a lot better if it was in color, um, but you can see here the white columns, how they are labeled dorsal ventral for uh, front or back and front or posterior and anterior, the lateral, and then the horns are labeled similarly as well. Okay, so that's the end of this. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'll put the links to the Google activities in the chat and then I'll continue on with the next uh, PowerPoint. So just bear with me for one second here. And if you guys have any questions, let me know too. So I'll put both links in at one time um, and I'll try to put the lab activity six first and followed by lab activity seven. These lab activities are fun because they're videos about sheep brain dissection and sheep eye dissection. Um, and then they're both like three minute videos and then answering just five questions. So they'll be pretty simple to do. So lab activity six is shown there. And I've already opened them for you. So I want you guys to pay attention to me, but you can always kind of start them. Probably hard to listen to a video and me at the same time. And there's lab activity seven. Okay. So these are two Google activities. Make sure you do both of them. And then we'll finish with this next PowerPoint, which is on the special senses of the eye and ear. So the special senses of the eye and ear, we're just going to focus on labeling anatomy of the eye and ear. Um, the oracle, also known as the pinna, um, is the funnel that leads sound into the external auditory canal. That makes up your external ear. The middle ear is filled with air and is made up of your three ossicles, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, as well as the tympanic membrane, which is your eardrum. So that makes up the inner ear. It's all air filled. And then the inner ear is all filled with fluid. We have your semicircular, three semicircular canals, the ampulla, the vestibule. Um, this area of the inner ear works with like equilibrium, maintaining balance of rotational and vertical motion uh, due to gravity or any sort of movement. And then the cochlea is the snail um, shell shaped structure that helps with hearing. Um, and then if you look at the vestibular cochlear nerve, it's cranial nerve number eight. There's two branches of it. One goes to the vestibule and one goes to the cochlea. 
So this is the anatomy of um, the ear. Here's a look at a ear model that we would have in lab, um, labeling the same thing that we talked about. Here's the auditory eustachian tube. Um, it will collapse. And then that popping sound you hear is when it kind of pops back into place. The tympanic membrane also kind of pops back into place. This is what happens when you go up into high elevations, whether, whether you're in the mountains or in an airplane. Um, you have a muscle, the tensor tympani muscle. Um, you have your malleus, incus, and stapes. The stapes will be the one attached to the oval window. The semicircular canals, ampulla, vestibule, cochlea, and the vestibular cochlear nerve. So just another view of kind of the, what the previous slide showed. This is a look at the structures of the cochlea with a zoomed in version of the organ of corti, also known as the spiral organ. So remember that cochlea is like a snail, shape, snail shell shaped structure. If we were to unwind it, so it's like one long line, and then we take a cross section through it, we would see that there's three um, kind of areas within that cochlea. The scala vestibuli is the chamber on top. The scala media or cochlear duct is in the middle and the scala tympani is at the bottom. The basilar membrane, um, if we zoom in on the organ of corti, the spiral organ, the basilar membrane makes up the base of that. And the hair cells will be connected to that basilar membrane. And then they will be embedded into what we call the tectorial membrane. And sound will cause bending of these hair cells and the bending of the hair cells, that bending is picked up through this, these cochlear nerve fibers. And you can see how they exit out of the organ of corti there. Um, the spiral ganglion are just, gang they're cell bodies of these neurons, um, but this is where the sensation of hearing comes from. These hair cells will bend and the bending produces a nervous response that is then sent up to the brain. Here's a um, hist histological view of the cochlea, which is kind of fun to see. Um, the scala vestibuli, that chamber, the cochlear duct, and then the scala tympi tympani, and you can see the organ of corti is located um, between those two chambers right there. Then we get to the eye. Here are the external structures of the eye. Um, the pupils, the black part, iris, sclera, um, the upper eyelid, lower eyelid, eyebrow, the lag lacrimal caruncle is that kind of medial pink bump. And the medial canthus is just that kind of border of that bump. Here's another look at the eye from a model. This shows the lacrimal glands on the lateral upper side of the eye. They produce tears that will wash over your eye, keep it clean, get rid of bacteria. And then those tears drain into the nasolacrimal sac, down the nasolacrimal, nasolacrimal duct into your nasal cavity. And that's why when you cry, you have excess tears running through and they come out your nose, so you might need a tissue. And yeah, you can see, also see the muscles attached to your eye as well. This is the tendon of one of the um, six extrinsic eye muscles, the superior oblique muscle. And you can see where the um, bones of the face, the facial bones are kind of surrounding that orbit. Um, here are the six extrinsic eye muscles, how they're attached to the eyeball. You can also see the optic nerve will be attached to the back of the eye coming out. You can see your lateral medial rectus on the lateral medial side, superior and inferior rectus, top and bottom. And then the two oblique muscles are attached at the eyeball at an angle, um, one at the top and one at the bottom. Here are the movements of the eye and the muscles that are responsible for those movements. And then on the inside of the eye, um, if we kind of follow the direction of how light would travel, light would come through the cornea, which is a transparent um, concave shape. So light comes through the cornea, through the pupil, which can dilate or constrict, and then through the lens. Got an interruption here. You can sit with me. Um, so light then comes through the lens and the, the lens will change shape to kind of focus that light on the back of the eye. The fovea centralis is the area of highest vision where you'll have most cones. And then the macula lutea is a depression within the fovea centralis. Thanks. She was up at like 4 a.m. this morning, so she is not in a good mood, but that's number one of three children. 
maybe you'll get the chance to see the rest. <laughs> um, so, and some of this should be reviewed from lecture a little bit, but what else? Here's the anterior chamber that contains the watery aqueous humor. The posterior chamber um, contains also aqueous humor, but the vitreous chamber is where we'll have the more vitreous or jelly-like humor. Yes, Michelle, thank you for bringing this up. So these slides, um, they're not in the manual. I put them on a separate file in Canvas. So you have to download the PowerPoint file from Canvas. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I almost forgot to tell you that. These slides, see if you can find them in Canvas under lab files. Um, if you can't, let me know and I'll get them to you. But this is one that didn't make it into the eLab. And they're on the lecture uh, files. They're in the lecture? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you yeah, did that's, find them. That's our, yeah, that's our study. I used the, the lecture PowerPoints and the, okay. the lab exercises. So they're not in the eLab, but yeah, they should be in the Canvas files. All right, the ciliary muscle um, is connected to suspensory ligaments and this just controls the shape of the lens. I think I got everything else. The sclera is the white part of the eye. So there's three layers to the eye. The sclera is the white part. The choroid is the second layer where all your blood vessels will go through. And then the retina is the innermost layer. That's your nervous layer where all of your photoreceptors will be. Uh, the optic disc um, will be the place where your blood vessels enter into the back of the eye through the optic nerve kind of within that. And at the optic disc, you have no photoreceptors. So we call that your blind spot. So here's a look at those same structures, but with a model that you would see um, in our lab at school. Uh, so you can see here the optic nerve attaching. This is a great look at the different layers of the eye. The sclera is white, choroid will be reddish because it has the blood vessels, and then retina is the third layer. The vitreous humor will be that jelly-like substance that gives the eyeball its shape. Um, and then you can see here, this is not the best picture. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but there's your lens connected to the ciliary muscle with the suspensory ligaments. The iris is a smooth muscle that controls the shape of the pupil to dilate or constrict and the cornea. And you can see the chambers there labeled as well. Um, this is an examination of the right eyeball to visualize the retina from a fundoscopic. This is a look at the retina um, under kind of that same examination. So if you, we were to look inside the eye at the retina, we can see the optic disc where all the blood vessels come through and just lateral to um, the, the optic disc will be the macula lutea that depression that within it has the fovea centralis. And again, the fovea centralis is about the size of a pin and it's, in, it's within the center of the macula lutea. And the fovea centralis, again, is the area of highest visual acuity because you'll have the most cones located there. Uh, this is a look at the histology of the retina. Um, so light will travel like through the vitreous chamber and bounce off the pigmented layer and the photoreceptors first. And then it will travel back up through these different layers of ganglion cells, horizontal cells, and eventually um, connect to axons of the optic nerve. And then that all that photoreceptor information will travel through the optic nerve. So that's what this path of light shows. Light will bounce all the way back to the pigmented layer and then work its way back up through these cells uh, to the axons of that optic nerve. And that is the end of this PowerPoint as well.